I'm Evan Smith. He's the coolest astrophysicist in the universe, the director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History, and the host of the new documentary series Cosmos, a space-time odyssey, premiering in March on Fox. He's Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. This is Overheard. Actually, there are not two sides to every issue. So I guess we can't fire him now. I guess we can't fire him now. <laughs> the night that I win the Emmy. Being on the Supreme Court was an improbable dream. It's hard work and it's controversial. Right. Without information, there is right. no freedom. And it's journalists who provide that information. Window rolls down and this guy says, hey, he goes to 11. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Tyson, welcome. Thanks for having my first time. Uh, it's wonderful to have you yeah, here, and you. Uh, the coolest guy in the world. Uh, in the world. Right, in the introduction, in the I was the universe. coolest in the universe. So well, now I'm it's down, the world. I've downgraded what did, you. What did I do in the last five seconds <laughs> to lose? <laughs> we'll, we'll edit that out. <laughs> uh, it's an, an honor to meet you, and I, I'm, uh, I'm so excited about this series. I and others here, I'm sure, and people watching remember the Carl Sagan series. Yeah, yeah. This is the sequel. Which was 1980, so right. it's 34 so years long ago. Long time ago, but in, if anything, in the interim, the interest in the subject matter has gotten more mass, it seems like. More people are interested in this stuff, partly because of you and partly because of others like you, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I th I'm just a conduit for people to access the cosmos. So humble. No, no, I, I, I don't... It's inherently interesting. Yeah. It's inherently mind-blowing. Right. I, I just have a vocabulary to reveal that fact. Right. So, so I... I'm not creating an interest in the universe that the universe didn't already earn. Right, but you're making it accessible or helping to make it accessible to a wider audience, and for that, you know. Yeah, I'm just you trying open vistas. Yeah. For that access. That's, yeah. That's really all it is. So, whose idea was this uh, redo of the program? Or well, this I think the sequel. The uh, Andrian, who is a collaborator, a right. collaborator and widow of, widow Carl, of Sagan, Carl Sagan, she co-wrote the original Cosmos back right. in 1980 along with Steve Soder, the three of them, Carl yeah. Sagan, uh, in, in the group. And it wasn't, after Carl died, this was uh, 1996 yeah. or 97, around there, uh, I was asked by the board of the Planetary Society. This is a group that Carl Sagan co-founded that would, it's an organization, Carl Sagan felt that the public needed to be more engaged in our ambitions for the exploration of space and yep. the planets. And so the Planetary Society promotes the peaceful exploration of space. He died. Then they invited me to join the board. Yep. In that environment, I had uh, many more encounters with Andrean, Carl Sagan's yep. widow, because she's on the board as well. Right. And then Anne felt comfortable to pop the question. You're the one. Yeah, so right. so that's what this, it was. And, and this is not exactly a remake as George Clooney might remake Ocean's Eleven. This is actually oh. a sort of roll forward, right? This or, is, or the movie Gravity. Or, right? or, might, well, we're going to come back to Gravity. <laughs> I, I know you have an opinion George about Clooney this. George Clooney, does he remake Gravity? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> and in the, in the sequel, yeah, he's actually still in orbit and they capture him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. you, you can't resist. Um, <laughs> no, wait, wait. So yeah. you mentioned George Clooney. I didn't. Right. All right. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm just teeing it up for later. <laughs> so, so this is not, you're not remaking the, the original no, no, series the shot by shot. It's, it's the continuation. It's the continuation right. of this great unfolding cosmic yeah. journey. And it's unfolding. So it's, it's, it's different. Space is different. Or the yeah, I should say it's expanding, not yeah. unfolding. Because right. it's not. <laughs> right. It's an expanding universe. But there are things now that are interesting to talk about and to think about that differ from what was interesting all those years ago. Of course. Yeah. And uh, not only that. You know, as it's as they say, you know, as the area of our knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of our ignorance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so I'm going to let you keep going. No, no, no. <laughs> so, so the simple fact that you know more, yeah, doesn't necessarily mean that there's less out there to then learn. Yeah. We now. No, we now stand in new places and are asking questions undreamt of before. Right. So it's not like there's this set of questions Finite and knowledge. now we answer these and right. we gotta answer these. No, we'll answer all of them. And then there's a whole other set of questions right. we didn't imagine. Right. And so we are in an era now where uh, in the first cosmos it was, do other stars have planets? Yeah. 
Now that we got a catalog of a thousand planets orbiting other stars. Right, we've answered the question. Not only answered it, but yes, we've answered it, but now let's ask other questions. Do any of them have life that we can measure right. through the spectroscopic signature of its atmosphere? Well, you know Earth has life in advance before you even land here yeah. because it's got oxygen. Right. Oxygen is unstable in the atmosphere of a planet. Oxygen is highly reactive. It would just go away. And the old idea, well, let's find an oxygen planet to go live on. It's, the oxygen was made by the life on the planet. It's not some pre-existing thing that you then just step into yep. with your bed ready-made for you. So now that we have a catalog, let's find ways to probe them more deeply. Yeah. Back 34 years ago, no one is thinking of spectroscopic observation of planetary atmospheres. So, but that's just one tiny example of how, yep. as you gain knowledge, more questions arise. Why, why this series on Fox as opposed to some other channel? PBS? Ha ha well... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't say it. <laughs> well, you know, you, you, you'd think that something like this, sort of serious, substantive, would not find its way onto the same network as Family Guy. Although the creator of Family Guy is involved in the production side of this program. Is he not Seth MacFarlane? That's why it's on Fox. I'm not dissing him or it, but I'm just saying it's, it's awfully mass-focused. As to have science be should be. I like to hear you say that. That's good. <laughs> But, it, but in some ways, in some people ways... People say, no, no, wait, hey. So people say, uh, why is Cosmos on Fox? There's nothing but, you know, science nitwits that watch Fox. And I say, that's why it should be on Fox. I mean, what, 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 why, why is that? What are you trying to do here? Yeah. I mean, I said, if it's true that people who don't know science watch Fox... Perfect. Cosmos yeah. belongs on Fox. That's it. End of conversation. That's it, right. <laughs> but I, I but guess... You, what yeah. you're trying to tell me here is... Put it on in the places where everyone is already highly Smart. educated, all right? <laughs> Put it there. Yeah, that, uh, what does that do? I, that... Guess, I guess this is not so much about demand as it is about the assumptions I hope you're correct in making about audience, which is to say that although there may be a great need for people to be better educated about this stuff, are you going to a place where people are going to buy, right? So you're, you're providing something, and I'm hoping, and I'm sure you're hoping. We say buy. Meaning yeah. that people are going to actually watch it on a commercial network. The kind of commercial network viewer will say, yes, I'm ignorant about That's this. That's the extraordinary fact yeah. of it landing on Fox. Yeah. They yeah. say, let's create product that brings pathways into their portfolio yeah. from all the possible American demographics, demographics they can dream up. Yeah, and then everybody's watching Fox for some reason or another. Yeah. And now we put the science uh, program on it, so. and they're putting a budget in it that yeah. would have been unrealistic had it been done sort of uh, philanthropically. Yeah. So, so we'll see. It's we'll a see. big experiment. They know it's an experiment, but everybody's there for it's it. It's exciting. How, how, do you, how will you differ from a personality behind this thing uh, from your predecessor, uh, uh, Dr. Sagan? I'm going to be saying trillions and trillions. <laughs> <laughs> going to channel no. the man? Is that what you're going to do? No, he said billions and billions. Billions, so you're right. going to update, uh, right? Yeah. You, well, now you got it. See, it was a little too <laughs> slow there. <laughs> so uh, how, no, no. Yeah. So what matters here is the spirit, the legacy, yeah. the mission statement that Cosmos brought to the screen that people remembered for generations after. You remember Cosmos in ways that you don't remember other documentaries that Definitely. aired before, during, or since. Definitely. So something was different about it. And when we analyzed it, it was clear that, thought that um, Cosmos has as a priority, not only teaching you some science, but then alerting you how that matters and why it matters to your life, to us as species, as shepherds of the earth that brings us life and nourishment, yeah. and what our place is in the universe. This is a cosmic perspective that you then take ownership of because you are a participant in the cosmos. Yeah. When that's the messaging that comes out, and by the way, you're learning some science along the way, it's indelible to you. So going forward, that is what we are putting into the next show, yep. continuing this journey. If you're going there only to see how well I can imitate Carl Sagan, you'll probably be disappointed. disappointed right, yeah. And in fact, they say, well, how are you gonna do Carl? And it's like, no, I'm not, I could try to do it, I would just fail. Yeah, you're just At best, be, I'd be sort of okay, yeah. but I can be a really good version of myself. Of you. Yeah, that's right. That's a character so, you can play, right, yeah. <laughs> why, uh, wh why, why in this country is there such a need for the average person to know more? Why don't we know more about this stuff, organically? Yeah, I, that's a great question. And I, I don't 
know if I know why. I, I can, let me give a pie in the sky answer. Sure. And uh, during the 1960s, when we were on our way to the moon, every week, by the way, in the 60s, we had a Cold War, a hot war, the civil rights movement, campus unrest, and we were going to the moon. We managed to do that. Yes. Right. In the face of all of that, the, the blood of that decade. Yes. As much blood as we, had, we hadn't seen since 100 years earlier during the Civil War, just on our, and turbulence of what we were as a nation yeah. was tested in that decade. While that's going on, we go to the moon. And what happens in that journey from Mercury to Gemini to Apollo? Every next mission is more ambitious than the previous one. The press writes about that. If the, the next mission is longer in space, higher in space, faster in space, farther away in space, that's a headline. So now, in the midst of all the war, there's a headline about the role of science and technology, the STEM fields, in our future. And what comes out of that? The New York World's Fair. It's all about what will tomorrow be like? Right. Articles in Look Magazine, Life Magazine, Newsweek, talking about the city of tomorrow, the home of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow. People are dreaming about tomorrow. And they're dreaming about tomorrow, I claim, because they saw the power of investments in science and technology and engineering, what it can bring for you, what it does to your vision statement as a human being. What happens at, in 1972, we stop going, we stop leaving Earth, we stop going to the moon, all those articles go away. Right. They stop. And then disco comes in and everybody <laughs> only cares about themselves. Right. Oh, there's a whole change in what people care about. Mm -hmm. And I think if the nation dreamed big, then its citizenry dreams big. So we're not dreaming anymore, that's part that's of correct. the problem. And of course you mention all the things that happened in the 60s and yet we still found that's correct. ambition and money to do this other thing. That's correct. We're, well, we're war basically, helped to drive that. We're but basically getting out of the space business now. I mean some would argue that no, we're doing this and this and this, but it just seems like our ambitions have been significantly diminished. Yeah, I mean the, the, the rubric is, yeah, we're, we're, we're planning to go to Mars. So I asked the administration, well, when? Oh, 2030. Well, so, all right, so we're going to go to Mars under an administration yet to be named on a budget yet to be established. Right. And this is how presidents are now promising a plan for the yeah. future. So I think that is unfortunate. Yeah. Back when Kennedy said, let's go to the moon, return him safely to Earth, in the decade. He, he meant did, now. That, he, that, he meant now, yeah. and had he not been shot, probably would have gotten second term. That would have happened under his watch, yeah. where he could continue to invest the political capital that such a... Uh, such a mission statement requires. Right. Not, not to mention the financial capital, and today when we talk about the capital required to do all this, it's often privatized. Well, so except the private industry will never, in spite of whatever they will tell you, Yeah. I, bring them here, they'll tell you, I don't know what they're going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. Okay, you, right? tell, you tell they, me. <laughs> Go ahead, you tell me. Uh, by my read of the history of civilizations yeah. and human motivation and conduct, the private enterprise can never lead the space frontier. Because? Because. Space Frontier is expensive, it's dangerous, and has unquantified risks. If you put all three of those under one umbrella, you cannot then establish a capital market valuation for that activity. Yep. You can't say, all right, who's my investor? Oh, you are, okay, and then you ask me questions. Well, what's the return? I, I don't know. Yep. Will anybody die? I don't know, probably. Uh, how much <laughs> is it? Really expensive. Are you in? No, you're finding something else to invest in. Right. The way this happens in the past is governments take the first step. Right. And they draw the maps. They find out where the trade winds are. They, find, they establish the patents necessary to make those first steps. Yep. Then private enterprise comes in behind it and does it efficiently, makes a buck on it. That's what SpaceX is doing, carrying cargo to the space station. Yep. SpaceX is not launching the first mission to Mars, no. When the government does it, they might give us the vehicle that we'll pay for, right. but they're not going to make that a private thing. Yeah. There's no money in it. You, sorry, sorry. You could do it as a vanity project. Okay. Bill Gates says, let's go to Mars. Fine. Get money, you'll pay it, but it's not a business model. Yep. Right? It's not a, a sustainable... And the country, and in, a, in a kind of corny sense of who we are as a nation, the country doesn't own that if Bill Gates or somebody else does it. Right. Yeah, but I, I'm telling you, he's not going to. If he does it, it's a one off. Right, that's it's just one offs. Yeah, and so, one -off. uh, if you want to turn a space program into a space industry, yeah. you've got to sort of find capitalizable activities. Tourism, for sure. Yeah. But you're not going to tour, you're not going to be a tourist on the frontier. Right. That's a dead tourist, right? Right. So, 
I'd, I'd rather go to the beach, honestly. So <laughs> it, it, that may just be me. You, your, your phrase earlier, not mine, although I love it, science nitwits. We seem to be at war in some segments of no, this no, country. No, no, that wasn't my phrase. It was other people asking me why well, Fox. Whoever is phrase it is. Okay. Uh, peace. Peace on that. The, the person I was quoting those who, who coined that phrase. Who couldn't figure out we why. We seem to be at war in this country in certain segments of the country with science. Why? What part of these are facts don't the so-called science nitwits understand? Why are we constantly having to defend what appears to be something that doesn't need to be defended? So uh, a point I think I didn't finish making when I was referencing yeah. the 60s is that when science is laid bare on the daily headlines, yeah. you cannot sweep that under the rug and say science doesn't matter where science doesn't invent a tomorrow, yeah. where science doesn't matter to me, right. because it is there daily. Yeah. And so if the nation is not doing some big science project, like going to the moon or Mars or beyond, then we're susceptible to forgetting, by my read of this, we're susceptible to taking for granted all that science actually has done for you. Yeah. You have people who are, who are working their, the GPS feature on their iPhone saying, you know, I don't, you know, I don't, we shouldn't, why are we wasting money in space, right? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, it's a satellite telling them where grandma's house is. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. so there's a disconnect between what science is actually doing for us yeah. and what people think it's doing for us. And that disconnect is resolved right. when there are huge projects that are going on and everybody knows about it. That, that's a practical answer. And yes, I'm, I'm that's how I I'm, think. And I'm grateful to have. But let me, let me go a little further down in this and to ask... To an unpractical is, place? A little bit. Okay. Is there a disconnect between science and belief? Because you have people yes. who, would, who would put belief yes. ahead of science. You think yes. the answer is yes? Oh, yeah. And, and so what do you do about that? Nothing. <laughs> live and let live. No. Well, so no. I'll, let me be a little clearer, okay? Yeah. Uh, we live in a country that was founded on religious freedoms. When you said belief, you were afraid to use the word religion, well, so I'll say for you. I was thinking you, about it more broadly than that, but go there. That's fine. That is so where you were going. Okay, <laughs> just don't even. Okay. So. I have to be here after you go. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, the nation was founded uh, in large measure on the ability to express your religious beliefs, no matter what that religion is. Yep. And. So one of the things that enables it is that the Constitution makes no mention of God, of any stripe. Okay, actually, there's one really trivial mention of God, um, but you can ask me later where that is. In any okay. event, so so there's no mention of God, which means the nation cannot establish a state religion. Cannot. Therefore, you are free to express whatever religion you want, and I don't have a problem with that. Right. The, the religious immigrants. The, the immigrants that came here to seek religious freedoms because they were persecuted in their home country. I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem if you want to take your religion and put it in my science classroom. That's when I have the problem. That's all. It's that simple. And, and you need to understand that if religious philosophy substitutes for science, you have to understand the consequence to that. The consequence is innovations in science and technology. We have known ever since the beginning, I should be clarify what I mean by beginning there. Um, <laughs> ever since, <laughs> uh, innovations in science and technology, especially in this, the 21st century, will be the engines of tomorrow's economies. So if in this free country, you would rather learn religion and not science, because you fear it, or you think it, it, it undermines your religious philosophies, just understand the consequences. The nation will slide in its economic leadership of the world. It's already sliding in its economic leadership. Yep. And if, just be aware that that's what'll happen. That's the choice you're making. That's your choice, yep. all right? So uh, that's all I'm telling you. By the way, there's no tradition of scientists let alone atheist, knocking down the Sunday school door, saying, oh, that might not necessarily be true. They're not picketing outside of churches. <laughs> churches have been respected by even non-believers since the beginning. Yet why do I have religious people coming, picking it outside my science class? I don't understand that, actually. Uh, part of me thinks that they, they want to uh, boost the 
the sort of authority of their religious philosophies if they appear in a science curriculum, because they already know science actually has quite a bit of uh, power in this world. Yep. Uh, it decides, I mean, science is everywhere in everything, even if you don't want to think so. Right. Yeah. We have just a couple of minutes left. Let me toggle over from one subject that gets you animated to another. Why didn't you like gravity? No. <laughs> I, I, I you read mean the your, film, the film, not actual stuff falling. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I love me some gravity. All right, yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just. <laughs> you, uh, I didn't float in here, so I don't like this gravity <laughs> stuff. You know. You, uh, you, you essentially reviewed this film 140 characters at a time on Twitter. Yeah, actually, I tweet 125 characters, but who's counting? Okay, well, yeah. apparently, I, I am incorrectly. So there. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. So, no, what, so no, what about have, it? You have 140 character limit, but I hold myself to a stricter standard. Okay. Yeah. 125. If only George Clooney did. See where I went with that? Right. Actually, so, right. yeah. so I tweeted, I saw the movie IMAX, the preview, Yeah. Big, big screen, right. glasses, all right. And, you know, there's the debris coming in. I don't know if you saw the movie, but it's, it's basically a survival movie in space is what it is. Yeah. It's Survivor in space. And I didn't give anything away by that. And so I saw the movie. Well, they did a lot of brilliant things. Got a lot of physics right. And because it got so much physics right, I felt justified in highlighting a few of the things it got wrong. Yeah. So, so, so uh, one of the things it got right is they kept going in and out of airlocks. And in an airlock, you make a vacuum or you fill it with air. They did it right. Any noise inside the airlock yep. went away as the air evacuated. And here's a thing still banging and you don't hear it. And then the air comes in, and then you hear it come back. Yep. They, they got that. That's, 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 that's physics 101. And there's a lot of other physics they got right. Like if you get set into motion, you're going to stay in motion. Newton was smiling at, at this. <laughs> but, at, but unless an outside force yeah. acts on you. And she's trying to, uh, Sandra Bullock is trying to get from one place to another. She ran out of propulsion. Oh, grab the fire extinguisher. That'll give you propulsion. And sure enough, she does it. Except... She should have put it at her center of mass so that she would just move this way. Yeah. But she put it higher up on her chest, and then you just tumble. You say, that's what happened. You'll move, but you'll also rotate. Right. Right? She created a torque on her <laughs> axis of rotation. All right. But anyhow, so I put out 10 tweets. I don't forgot the number. It was not a lot. And I said, mysteries of gravity. <laughs> One of them. Why is Sandra Bullock a medical doctor? repairing the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> Get her the hell off my machine. <laughs> right? I know I'm saying, and I don't, you know, I don't walk into her operating table and cut open a chest. <laughs> and she's a medical doctor, and there's George Clooney schooling her on the effects of oxygen deprivation. Excuse me, she's a medical doctor. So, uh, so dude, I just had these had mysteries of gravity. Did, did and, you, yeah. and, and wait, but at the end, I said, by the way, I really loved the movie. Yeah. But people thought I hated All it. All they remembered were the ten tweets. So, yeah, because yeah. they didn't keep reading, right? right yeah. And so, but it was on. It showed up on the Today Show, on <laughs> Brian Williams, on, 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 on Saturday Night Live's Weekend Update. Yeah. People went <laughs> bat crazy. Yeah. I left out a word in you there. You did. did. Bat crazy. <laughs> so here. Three weeks later, there's still debates in the blogosphere about this, and I said to myself, whoa, we live in a time where you can now have bar fights over the physics that went on in a number one feature movie. And I thought that... It's a great country. That, yeah. So times are shifting. I think Cosmos will land on very fertile ground. Yeah. The, the number one sitcom on television is called The Big, Big Bang, Bang Theory. Theory. Right. And, and, right. Six fans over here, okay? The rest of you, you can buy a TV, you know. They're kind of, they're... <laughs> or the channels other than PBS, yeah. you might turn on. Well, it's all, it's all good news. Yes, I think it's all uh, hopeful, hopeful, I should say. Uh, they're telling me we're done. I could sit here and talk to you forever. This, you make this stuff fun, I gotta say. No, it's already fun. I'm just revealing that fact. Okay, well. Okay. <laughs> uh, I assert... Um, Good luck. Keep doing it. Hope the show is a big success. Thank you very much. And even if it fails, uh, I think it's still a, an offering yeah. for people to take it 
uh, if they choose. Well, we love it. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. We'd love to have you join us in the studio. Visit our website at klru.org slash overheard to find invitations to interviews, Q&As with our audience and guests, and an archive of past episodes. Einstein comes up with a new law of gravity, his general theory of relativity. Do they replace Newton? No. They draw a bigger circle around the applicability of Newton's laws.